Anthony. Uh, so, Mr. Angel, I'd like you to turn to page three of your April uh, 18th, 2022 draft report. Page three. Okay. Uh, April 18th. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. In the last paragraph, the first sentence, there's a phrase, quote, that were identified by council as potentially of interest. And you can see that it's highlighted and has a, has a comment. The comment says, NTD, should we ask him to delete this? Do you see that? I, I don't see the um, comments. They're not on my printed copy. Oh, they're not on your printed copy. Maybe we could put it on the screen. Uh, it's page three, like in the in the report page numbering. So if you just scroll down, um, it should be there. Oh no, sorry, you're looking at the. Um, we need the report itself, not the uh, not the uh, the red line. So if it's got a comment on it, is it the uh, track changes? Track changes. Oh. Um, That's not no. So there's another version. I guess we'll need to print it separately. There's a version of the April 18th where there are comments from myself from council. Um, we'll put an electronic copy on the screen. We'll send an electronic copy to the court and we'll print you a hard copy. Lots of copies. <laughs> um, it's not on page three because page three of the. So you're looking at the red line. I'm looking. So the version of the document I'm referring to is there. Yeah. So it so it seems like what we sent you was the clean version, and we've also sent you the red line. The clean version, for some reason, uh, doesn't have um, the track changes comment in it. So we need to send that to you. But that was sent to you. It's not in the. The, the subsequent document the June, uh, the no no only the April 18th document has these comments um, so if you could go to page three of that document and I believe my friends have electronic copies that we sent you the word versions of the documents from last evening electronic page three so the electronic copy of the document which would not be in the physical copy um, yes you you don't we will get you a copy What will, it, what, what will it be called? The red line version of the result? Um, I'd suggest calling it the name you already had and just add with comments. Okay. And so if we go down on this uh, page three, so it, it has to be page three not in as represented by word, but as in the document itself. So if you go down, there's page numbering. That's page two. So if you go down to page three. Page begins the corresponding text. Correct. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry. You've gone too far. Go up, please. The one that says NTD. Down. Sorry. The red line. Okay, so um, in that last paragraph, the first sentence, sorry, so we, this is the comment. It says, NTD, should we ask him to delete this? Um, do you see that? Yes, I do. Did Ontario Council identify certain documents for you to consider when drafting your report? 
Not exactly. What you did was you provided a very large collection of documents with an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it was a uh, was sent to me by one of your clerks, um, and it was simply everything that you thought might be of interest to me for doing this research. In the end, um, the vast majority of the documents were about the arbitration proceedings, and I didn't end up relying on the collection at all. I just did my own research because I found it easier to just do it myself. Okay. And the sentence that is highlighted through the comment here, um, is that sentence in your final report? Uh, no, I took that out. And what, why did you take it out? Uh, honestly, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't remember. It's okay. We're we're going to ask you about what you do remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, could we go to, um, in the document itself, page 19 of this draft report? Thank you. Um, and in the last full paragraph, um, the last sentence has a comment that reads, quote, for team, not helpful. So there is no consistency to ITA rates being applied. Do you see that? I do. What is ITA? Uh, that's the term for Indian trust account rates. Yeah, I, yeah, Indian trust accounts. Sorry, which um, line was it for? Um, so, at, uh, so on the electronic copy, is that what the court's looking at? Um, that's right. Um, so at, on the electronic copy, in the last full paragraph, so not the partial paragraph right yeah. at the bottom, but the full paragraph above it, right towards the end, there's a comment, if you look to the right, it says for team, not helpful. So, um, and so, Mr. Angel, what did you make of that comment? Uh, it spoke to exactly what I was talking about before lunch, which is that I hadn't done a very good job of explaining how these accounts functioned and that I had work to do to, uh, to on the interest rates. And in particular, the, the issue with the interest rates is that the sources I was relying on to, you know, other secondary sources like a Joan Holmes report, um, the band trust account or the the manual, the band manual on interest rates. When you look at those, they suggest a very simple regime of interest rates that existed in this period, that there was simply one interest rate and it applied across the board and so on. That wasn't at all true. Uh, it turns out that the interest rates did vary quite a bit. And at the point that I drafted this and sent it to council, I didn't have a full picture of it. And so it looks, I took it to mean that for, from the point of view of council, this wasn't very helpful to them in framing whatever it is they needed to, to frame or argue or whatever. My job though, from that, just simply to get a better handle on what was happening with the interest rates, which is what I did. And I produced a table in the next draft that broke it down uh, year by, well, not year, didn't break it down year by year, broke it down period by period whenever there was some consistency in terms of how interest rates were treated. So yeah, that's, that's it really. Sorry, am I speaking too fast? My apologies. No? Okay. Does your final report discuss the different band trust account interest rates that apply in different circumstances? Can you explain what you mean by different circumstances? So the comment seems to be that I had a concern that there was no consistency in the ITA rates being applied. Does your final report talk about when a certain rate applies in, in a certain time period or to a certain circumstance, and then a different rate applies to a different time period or different circumstance? Does it have that kind of I see. description in your final report? Yes, it, it does. It does. Um, and I think we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, I'd like to turn to page 34 of the same document. So again, the page, um, the, the internal numbering.
And just at the top of the page, uh, this is the uh, discussion section um, that, that you testified to earlier, is that right? Correct. Um, and we won't retread that. We've heard Mr. Angel's testimony on that. Um, are there any other differences between your draft report of April 18th, 2022 and your final report that you'd like to point out right now? None come to mind. I'm sure that there's innumerable small differences. I rewrote many sections, um, but I, I don't have any that come to mind. Sure. Uh, so let's move on to your June 8th, 2022 draft report, um, which is exhibit E. -E? Thank you. Um, and you have a copy of that uh, uh, ahead of, uh, in front of you. Is this draft report substantially different from your final report dated June 30th, 2022? It's different, but uh, not, not as substantially different as the, the difference between April 8th and June 30th. Yeah, it, it's still different, but it's from an evolutionary point of view, this one is quite a bit more like the final report. It's got the structure there, it's got the tables, just I hadn't completed all of the tables. Um, there's uh, the apparatus of a report like this, the CV and other items that are missing, but it's substantially the shape of the report that was to come, just missing. Oh, and the, the one, the one uh, section, the written section that I developed a lot in the final report that isn't really reflected in this, is just the explanation of the treaty-wide annuity accounts, how they operated, and uh, how they um, how interest was calculated, and so on. Do you recall why you made the changes that you did between this June eighth draft and the June twentieth, uh, June thirtieth final version? <laughs> if you don't, that's okay. Just well, specific changes, or in general, I mean. Uh, in general, I made changes because it's an iterative process and I'm getting feedback from you saying, well, explain this better, I don't understand. So I revise things to, until, um, I think I put it earlier, until there's a, you know, a mutual understanding of, of what I'm trying to get across in this report, so. Okay, um, I'd now like to ask you a few questions about your June 21st or 22nd, uh, 2022 draft report, which I must be right on this, is Exhibit FF. Thank you. Um, can you explain, uh, Mr. Angel, please, the differences to the extent you remember them between this draft report and your final report on June 30th? I would have to look at it to remember. I, there's not a great deal of difference between this report and the final. The, the table or the appendix with the Robinson Superior annuity accounts that the, uh, the appendix D3, I think, um, I'd have to look at my report. There's an appendix where uh, section D, there's first an appendix with the Robinson here on annuity accounts that goes through them year by year. And then after that, there's one for Robinson Superior. That Robinson Superior table still wasn't done as of the June 22nd report. So that shows up in the final one. And then this is where I, it was after this, I think I removed the discussion section. I just need to have a look to make sure I'm getting that right. Um, so in June 22nd, the table showing the Robinson Superior annuity accounts was not done? Uh, the annuity account. Okay. The annuity yeah. Account. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And then the the discussion, yes. So the and June twenty second still has a version of the discussion, and that's missing from the final report. And um, can you explain briefly why you made the changes between the June twenty second version and the final version, to the extent you remember? A lot of the changes were just formatting, bringing things to a close to get the, get the report ready for submission to the court. Uh, the the table was you know, the substantial piece of work uh, that, sorry, I'll specify the, the Robinson Superior annuity table in the appendix, that was the substantial piece. And then 
Um, and then I've already explained why I dropped the discussion uh, section. So um, the rest of it, a lot of it was just formatting and cleaning things up. Does your final report dated June 30th, 2022 reflect the opinion you were offering to the court? Yes, yes, it certainly does. Um, if there's, just trying to think if there's anything where my thinking has evolved since then. Um, there are a couple things I noted just this morning when I was reviewing things again that I will raise when we do the, go through the slides, I, I want to point out. Um, so to that extent, and then, yes, and then there's a piece around the date for the first capitalization in the report. I have a certain date and then it's different in my slide. So I want to go into that and explain what that's about too. When drafting your reports did, or your report, did Ontario Council ever ask you to change your opinion? No, no. Did Ontario Council ever attempt to influence you? No, you were scrupulous. I lost count of the number of times you made it very clear that my opinion was what was to be offered in this report. All right, so after that short interlude, uh, we are now at Mr. Angel's slide deck. <clears throat> um, Mr. Angel, could you, there's a cover page on your slide deck. I don't know that you need to speak to that. Could you please speak to slide one in your slide deck? I'm just waiting for- Oh yeah, slide one, please. So uh, what would you like to tell us about slide one? Okay, uh, this is just an overview of the slides in the presentation. So uh, just some preliminary comments by way of background to the research I did, uh, an explanation of my understanding of how the, the Indian Trust Fund accounts sat as of 1850, uh, a description of the specific Robinson Superior Treaty Trust Fund accounts between the years 1850 and 1862, brief discussion of some reforms to the Indian trust fund account system that took place between 1859 and 1862, and a section on the specific Robinson Superior Treaty trust fund accounts between 1862 and 1909, a section on interest, the calculation and payment of, of interest, and then finally a, a few comments on crown control of First Nations funds. Okay, uh, can you please Talk to slide two. So these were the first two questions that I was working from. Uh, first was a very basic, <laughs> what were the Indian trust fund accounts and how did they operate? And then the second one, more specifically, you know, the trust fund accounts associated with the Robinson treaties and the First Nations who were beneficiaries of those treaties. Uh, I think they're pretty self-evident what those questions are asking. Okay, so can you tell us about slide three, please? Uh, these are the other two, two questions that I worked from, three and four. So the third one's about interest, how it was paid only with respect to the, uh, the treaty-wide Robinson Treaty trust fund accounts and then the trust fund accounts that were specific to First Nations who are beneficiaries of the two treaties. And then question four is asking me to look at the scope of authority. That I, often I use the term, the word discretion that was available to First Nations in the management of their trust fund accounts. Could you please explain to the court the difference between what you're calling the treaty wide accounts and the band specific sure. accounts? Okay, I, I do get to that later, but okay. So the treaty wide accounts, those are the um, accounts that were set up, one for each treaty area for Robinson Superior and Robinson Huron, where the annuity funds flowed into those accounts and then flowed out of them. So they're really their only function was to operate as flow through accounts. Uh, the band specific accounts were 
um, the accounts that were set up for the individual First Nations who are parties to the two treaties. And uh, these terms, treaty-wide and band-specific, those are my terms. Uh, I, I came up with them because I wanted some way of distinguishing these. Um, and so uh, it just to be clear about what we're talking about. And I, I might as well make the point now, uh, just to make sure that it, it gets, gets made, is that the Robinson Treaties are quite unusual and that you have these treaty-wide accounts. If you look at annuity, nations that received annuities in, in Upper Canada, Province of Canada prior to Confederation, the great majority of the time, the individual nations had their own annuity accounts. And so the annuity would flow into that nation's account and then flow out of it. Robinson treaties are quite different in that there's a collective account for all of the nations party to the superior treaty and party to the Huron treaty. So, um, and those accounts operated in a much more restricted fashion than the other annuity accounts did. So I, I think that's where a lot of the confusion can stem from as people don't understand the distinction between these annuity accounts as they were set up just for the Robinson Treaty versus the annuity funds that existed prior to that from Upper Canada. Um, if, can I ask here, um, when you say that the Robinson Treaty accounts were quite different, mm -hmm. was that because there were so many First Nation beneficiaries? I, I, I'm just not sure if the other accounts that you're talking about were the treaty was specific to a band right. in the first place. So Rice Lake Purchase, originally the treaty is just with one band and there's only one account for that band. Eventually it splits into three bands. And so you've got right. Mississaugas of Rice Lake and, and uh, Scugog and uh, Mud Lake. And then the accounts are, you get three different accounts afterwards. Um, Chippewas of Lakes Huron and Simcoe, initially there's just one account for that collective of three, three First Nations, then it gets split into three eventually. So I guess I'm just thinking out loud here. <laughs> um, and I was, I was actually thinking about it over lunch. Why is it that they set things up this way for the Robinson treaties with the annuity account? And I think some of it might've been administrative convenience. It's just easier to manage the annuities through a single account. But I've never seen anything written on that. I don't know if any of the other experts have spoken to the re reasoning behind that, but the correspondence I've looked at, there's nothing in there that explains. Well, I remember there was a, some correspondence between Robinson and officials in headquarters where he's letting them know about what he's done. And I, I think the instructions are quite simple. They just say, we're gonna set up a, a single account for the treaty, for each treaty with where we'll manage the annuities through that. So the reasoning behind that, isn't isn't clear from the document. Thank you. Uh, you referred to the Robinson Superior Treaty Wide Account as a collective account. Could you just explain what you mean by a collective account? Yeah, I don't use it as a term of any um, particular um, definition. I just mean that it it's not for a single First Nation. It's for the group of First Nations who are collectively party to that treaty. Um, let's go to slide four. Could you please tell us about slide four? So here I just uh, want to explain the research that I did. So the core set of records I relied on are these ledger books that were started in 1848. This is when the, uh, the Indian trust fund account system was integrated with the, the rest of the public account system in province of Canada. So they open a ledger book and they're all the, all the different accounts that exist in order to manage in, uh, Indian department at the time are entered into this one book. And that book continues in, in a manner of speaking, those ledger accounts continue to this day. So this is kind of the origin of, of the, the modern day um, trust fund account record keeping system, not the, not the trust fund account system as a whole, but the record keeping system originates in 1848. So uh, I looked at those records because they're the primary source for understanding how the accounts were structured and managed. I went to 1909 because after 1909, they're restricted. Uh, they're not open to the public. Uh, there's a, an entire other set of accounts that are published in the sessional papers that uh, I believe are part of the court record, but uh, I didn't use those because 
they often introduce errors. They restate things in different ways. Um, I don't like to use two different sets of sources for the same underlying data because uh, then you're comparing, potentially you're comparing things that don't agree, but you don't know why they don't agree. There's a whole range of subsidiary books of account. There's journals where initial entries are made. Uh, there's warrant books, there's land sales returns, annuity pay lists. Now, I didn't examine any of these as part of this research. I was really just focused on the flow of money within the main accounts. The one exception there are the bank account records from the 1850s. So when I say bank account records, I'm referring to chartered banks in the province of Canada. So Bank of Upper Canada, Gore Bank, Bank of Hamilton, Bank of Montreal. There was a number of them where the cash balances uh, held by the Indian department sat in these bank accounts. And there's bank books, really, just out of, for those who are older, you still remember going to the bank and getting your bank book and, and getting the printout in it or, or even the handwritten balance written out so that's what sits in the archives and you can look at those and they um, they were useful because they helped me understand how interest was being handled in the 1850s so that's why I made that exception and then lastly in terms of historical context I think it's quite evident from the report I'm not providing an overarching narrative here that wasn't my purpose I had my hands full just being able to explain the trust account system as such so I touch on uh, the transfer uh, to colonial officials. I touch on the orders in council that restructure the, the um, organization of the accounts between 59 and 61. But apart from that, I, I don't go into any of the larger context. And I'll just ask you if you're using short forms when you say between, I thought you said between 59 and 61. <laughs> that's 18. I see that the reporter did it. But uh, just to be clear for the record, Yes, I will. Um, use you touch on the OICs that restructure accounts between 1859 and 1861. Correct. And can I take from what you say that I actually lost exactly what you said you looked at, but you're looking at a record keeping system. That's right. And you wanted to stick with a single record keeping system. A single series within that record keeping system. A single series, and you did not use other things for reasons that you listed. That's or you right. did not go and, and do another um, analysis of other record keeping systems. That's right. If, if I had used the sessional papers, then I would have had to explain why there were differences between the sessional papers and the ledger, the original ledger books at times. It just gets extremely complicated. So. Um, or I could have extended it past 1909, but it wouldn't have been very helpful because the sessional papers only published the public accounts up to 1920s uh, in the form that, in the detailed form that I need them. I'm sorry. And the source that you were looking at is, you mostly called ledger books? That's the term I use for them. Thank you. I've, I've, I've seen the originals at the archives. I got to work with them uh, in the 19th early 90s and they're just large volumes like this the ledger size paper so i think 11 by 14 and uh, uh the first volume is unnumbered and then after that they're numbered one to that's <laughs> okay yeah I, you don't need all that detail <laughs> all right um so let's go to slide five um i don't want you to speak to all of this this sort of lays out your experience we've talked about that it's yeah. apparent in, in in your resume i think just if you could address the last bullet Yes, that's exactly what I plan to do. I am not an accountant, nor am I econom an economist, nor a financial analyst. So I've had to learn a lot about bookkeeping, and I've had the privilege of working closely with archivists uh, at the National or Library and Archives Canada, as it's known now, um, and learned a lot through, through the archivists who are specialized in those records. But I'm certainly not an accountant, and if you probed me on more technical details of accounting, I would not at all be able to answer and even more so for economics i don't claim i don't think like an economist and and uh, i don't I, f I find the modeling that economists do just doesn't make sense to me as an historian um and financial analyst i you know i understand basics of distinctions between stocks and bonds equity and fixed income and so on but i'm certainly uh, explaining the way financial markets worked say in the 19th century that's far beyond my ken 
Okay, uh, let's go on to slide six. Can you please speak to slide six? So I think I may have touched on this to some degree, but um, the, the trust fund accounts, the Indian trust fund accounts are part of a larger system of public accounts. And that process of integrating them with the public accounts does take place over time. Uh, you see entries for the expenditures relating to Indians in, in as far back as the 1830s, but the trust fund accounts proper only show up in, in 1848. The second bullet is really a definition I just produced for my own benefit. It's not something that I got from a, another source or a textbook. It just, it's what works for me to understand what these trust fund accounts are about. So I'll just read it. They provide an organized accounting record of revenues, expenditures, transfers, investments, and interest paid on monies held, managed, and administered by government on behalf of First Nations in the province of Canada and Canada. And just with respect, can I, can I just sorry. ask you where are you, are you reading from slide six? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I just the second bullet. You're Got on. it. Thank you. Um, so on the first bullet on slide six, you said they're part of the larger system of public accounts for which governments? Of the province of Canada and of Canada after 1867. Go ahead. Uh, so if we could go to slide seven, please. Uh, please speak to slide seven. So this was an area of confusion for a while, working through this with, with the client. The trust fund accounts are not bank accounts. Um, there are bank accounts that are part of the overall Indian trust fund system, um, but these are public accounts. And, and so they, they're simply a way of keeping track of monies within us a, a, a certain set of boundaries so monies that relate to a given first nation or monies that relate to a given treaty or monies that relate to a set of investments so they they don't there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between these accounts and a bank account um, there are bank accounts that are part of the overall system but that's a distinction um, and then i just point out that uh, the responsibility and and control over these accounts was initially held by imperial officials, passed over to colonial officials in Upper Canada, and then in and then the province of Canada, and then from there to, to Canada, the Dominion of Canada. And the province of Ontario was never itself responsible for the Indian Trust Fund. When you say that, you say, that's post-Confederation? Correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Angel, you say responsibility and control over the accounts passed from one set of crown officials to another. Can you give us sort of approximate dates for when that responsibility and control passed? Mm -hmm. It's a gradual process, but the but the um, significant transfer of control from imperial officials to colonial is is in 1860, uh, and then from province of Canada to Canada is in 1867. 1860 is the imperial to colonial. Correct. Thank you. All right, um, let's go to slide eight. Uh, could you please speak to slide eight? So I said earlier that the trust fund account record keeping that I used as my primary source uh, started in 1848. Prior to that, you did have Indian trust fund accounts um, as we understand them today, but just they weren't all consolidated and uh, organized in the way they are. You see these as far back as the 1830s and they were created so you could, so that officials could track sales of First Nations land or rentals. And then proceeds from these sales were often invested in a variety of, of securities. So those investments were tracked through account statements and then interest and dividends were paid on these investments. They had to track that. And then out of all of that, there were, there were payments, distributions to First Nations, and then expenditures. Um, I say expenditures of annuities, but not just annuities. That's incomplete. Expenditure of annuities and, and spending on other, other items. These, these uh, monies become a fundamental part of how First Nation communities 
uh, operate in this time period. The records are often incomplete, fragmentary, and inaccurate, so it's very difficult to, you, can't, you won't find a, a solid time series. After 1848, you've got a consistent time series right from, from that year up to the present day, but before that, it's, uh, there are always gaps, even with Six Nations, which is probably the most, well, it is the most comprehensive set of records. So, uh, Mr. Angel, due to the court's ruling that was made when you were present this morning, uh, we'll be skipping from slide eight to slide 17. It's kind of like uh, snakes and ladders when you get on a ladder, gonna skip a few. So if we could go to slide 17, um, could you please speak to slide 17? Sure, um, I pretty much have already. Uh, I'm just saying here that in 1848, those trust accounts for First Nations in the province of Canada, so that's modern day Quebec and Ontario, were consolidated into a single ledger volume. Uh, this volume was maintained by the Indian Department and the head of the Indian Department, the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, reported directly to the Governor General. So that was the senior Crown representative in the colony. All right, so let's go to slide 18. Um, could you tell us about slide 18, please? So what I described here is the basic structure of accounts that existed for First Nations as of 1850. There were three main types of accounts. There was a land fund. So this is used for revenues that come from land and timber sales, sometimes from rents and then expenditures that are related to that, like surveys, but oftentimes the land fund could be used for a much wider range of expenditures, especially in the early years. Um, the annuity fund is used to track the payment of annuities to First Nations, so those annuity treaties from the late, uh, just after uh, the War of 1812 and into the 1820s, you have all, several singles, you have several annuity treaties and those annuities um, were tracked using um, this annuity fund. The annuity fund also formed a source of, the distributions of annuities weren't always the full amount. Sometimes the annuity funds would be used by the band collectively for a, a purchase like a agricultural supplies, or it might be used for, for salaries within the, within the First Nation. There was a wide range of uses that came out of the annuity fund. Um, this is quite different from the Robinson Treaty Annuity Fund. And this is one of the areas that I'm concerned to, that we, uh, we appreciate the difference between them because there are lots of questions around, well, how could these funds have been used? And if they're used on the model of the annuity fund that existed prior to the Robinson Treaties, it could be used for a wide range of purposes. And First Nations at the time, prior to 1850, had a lot of input into how those, account, how those accounts were managed. That's not how it worked with the Robinson Treaty Annuity Fund. That's a flow through. Okay, okay. but um, just to understand this one before yeah. we go to the Robinson ones, I, thought, I was just looking back. I thought you said, we won't find all of the annuity funds in here. Did they come in initially? Did the, did the full annuity come into the fund initially, or can you tell? It came into the, yeah, the full annuity pay, was paid into the fund on an annual basis. So it wasn't capitalized until 18, 1869, 1870. But at this time, it's on an annual basis. It's voted by parliament or the legislature. Okay. Um, just discussing these annuity funds that existed as of 1850, did any of the Robinson Superior Treaty First Nations have an annuity fund account at this time? No, they didn't, no. Okay, and so now I think you were going to speak a little bit about the debenture accounts? Sure. The debenture accounts? Yeah, so it's, it's just picky. The reason why I call these land fund, annuity fund, but debenture account is because that's how they appear in the books. And the debenture account is really a register it's a register of investments or securities. So it lists all of the 
uh, funds that government invested in on behalf of First Nations. And in order to um, understand that fund, I went through all of the debenture accounts for all First Nations in Upper and Lower Canada and looked at all of the investments that were in there. And that shows up in table two in the report. And I did a quick and dirty analysis of what proportion by dollar value was at 5% and what was at 6% and it was approximately 90% were at 6%. So the majority, the great majority of the funds in this time period were earning, uh, earning 6% on those debentures. On those debentures, Sorry. but those, but those weren't the only investments or were they? As of this, as of 1850, these are the, you're, you're quite right. They're not the only investments. There are investments pertaining to Six Nations that are distinct from this. Uh, but the majority of First Nations, their investments are in debentures and they're recorded in this, yes. So as of, all of this is as of 1850. Correct, yeah. So there's historic investments that were made prior to 1850 that are still on the books as of 1850. So there's, um, there's, am I allowed to talk about it? Cause the slides were removed. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure what you're saying. I, I just wanted you to, I just wanted to make sure I caught what you okay. said earlier. So you don't have to explain what you said. I just want to actually get you to repeat okay. what you said. Okay. So you, you said that in this, debenture account, which is an account that was found for many First Nations, there were, on your slide, you say a variety of securities, but you say they were mo there were mostly investments made at 5 to 6%, and then you said, but the vast majority were made at 6%. Correct. And I asked, possibly opening up something I don't want to open up, were they all in debentures or is that just the name of the account? They're all debentures. In this account, they're all debentures. Thank you. And the, the debenture account, which First Nations does it relate to? Any First Nation in the province of Canada that had monies that were received from land sales or other revenue generating transactions, the Indian Department would have invested those monies in debentures. So it, it potentially any First Nation with, with revenues would have a debenture account. And so other than Six Nations, were there any other First Nations that you know of that had investments that are not reflected in this account? No, no. Six Nations are the only uh, First Nation that I'm aware of that had investments outside of the debenture account. The, the Six Nations had investments in the debenture account as well, but both. Okay. So let's go. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, let's go to slide 19. Um, so I'm going to ask you to speak to slide 19 and then we're going to go look at table two. Okay, sounds good. So I created a table. This was one of the items on my to do list after the April 18th draft report was. What did the what were First Nations investments in? So I went through all of the debenture accounts, listed them all, and uh, analyzed it. Um, the best I can tell, they are all fixed income securities, and uh, the dividends are all clearly stated in the in the register. Um, these were all purchased by government officials on behalf of First Nations. Now I haven't dug into the correspondence behind them. I I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there's correspondence or discussions between First Nations and Crown officials saying, we'd like to invest, it's possible. Um, it's not something that I've 
looked at. Um, so I, here I've stated that government officials have purchased these because clearly that part of it is, is true. Um, and then I just characterized these debentures, uh, municipal bonds, county bonds, a lot of uh, public works. Uh, there's other things. Well, you're going to show table two, so sure. you can stop there. Um, so if you could uh, put up table two, please. So is this table two from your uh, final report? Yes, it is. And so could you just, um, we'll briefly sort of go through the table, but first, could you describe sort of the structure of the table, the, the logic of the table? Sure. So the first column just lists the name of the debenture or investment. Sorry, where do I find it? Oh, uh, sorry, let me pull up the version. My mistake, I will find it in the paper copy. Is it in the report? Is it is I'm in pointing? the final report, yes. Um, thank you, page 14 is the beginning of it and it continues on to page 15. Thank you. And sir, when you were describing this table, um, when you said I went through all the debenture accounts, all the de debenture accounts of all the First Nations in the UPC? Correct. Okay. Uh, just for the record, I think UPC is United Province of Canada. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. So if you could explain the sort of structure and logic of the table, please. Sure. It's not a complicated table. The first column is just the name of the investment. Uh, the second column lists the different uh, First Nations debenture accounts. So by extension, they tell you which First Nations held these investments. So Chippewas of the Thames held City of Toronto bonds at 6% 6, 6 bonds. Uh, the third column refers to other Indian trust fund accounts. So in addition to all of the, um, the band specific uh, accounts at this time period, there's also a host of other accounts that uh, the Indian department manages. There's a general fund that is just a catch all where interest gets paid into that and they use it to pay some salaries and postage and legal fees and so on. There's a land management fund that starts in 1858. There's an industrial school fund from the 1840s. Um, so that uh, goes on for two pages. I've highlighted the, the um, Robinson Superior, well, actually, the, between the two, two treaties, I highlighted the one uh, nation from the two treaties that held uh, investments, that had investments in a debenture account, and that was Mishapakotan. It's entered here as Chief Toto Menes. Toto, you guys told me yesterday how it's supposed to be pronounced. Toto Meni, Toto Meni. Um, I'm having to relearn the pronunciation that I've used for many years. So. And that's Mitch Picotin? Correct. Thank you. So th that's the only nation from the Robinson Superior Treaty area that had uh, investments because they had, I, I don't know the details of the transaction, but in 1856, uh, 250 pounds uh, revenue came into their account. It was used to purchase uh, consolidated municipal loan funds at 6%. And the first column in table two is labeled debentures slash investments. You list all of them there. Each of those, are each of those uh, investments bonds or fixed income investments? To the best of my knowledge, those are fixed income. I conclude that because in the debenture accounts, they list the name of it and then they give the interest rate, there's nothing indicating that it's equity, that there's voting privileges or anything like that. They're treated as, as bonds. Can I ask this question? When the, the data, the raw data for this chart, does it come by looking at the Indian trust fund account for a First Nation, for a particular First Nation? Or are you looking up something that starts uh, under the debentures? It's both actually. Uh, I'm looking at accounts for each of those individual First Nations. Yes. Uh, but then there's also a recapitulation at the end of the ledger book. 
that lists all of the debentures. It's a, a consolidation of the information in the individual debenture accounts. Thank you. Um, if we scroll down table two just a tiny bit, um, you'll see one of the entries two thirds of the way down is the Grand River Navigation Company. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Uh, is that a stock or a bond? Uh, those are debentures, they're, they're bonds. And do you know what happened to the Grand River Navigation Company? It went bankrupt. Which First Nations were invested in the Grand River Navigation Company? Uh, six nations of the Grand River. Okay. So let's go on returning to your demonstratives. Let's go to slide 20. Could you please speak to slide 20? Mm -hmm. So this is about the treaty-wide annuity fund account for the Robinson Superior First Nations. It was established in 1851, shortly after the treaty signing. Make some broad comments here about the nature of the monies coming in and out. Um, monies coming in, legislative grants and refunds. I'm gonna correct that because I realized afterwards that this was, I was still thinking of both treaty areas and the refunds show up on the Huron account, but not in the superior account in this time period. In the 1850s, you don't see any refunds. Uh, so the only money coming in to the Robinson Superior annuity fund account in the 1850s to six, 18, 1862 as, as legislative grants. Um, which uh, legislature made those grants? Province of Canada. Monies going out were primarily payments to Indian agents for distribution, that's correct. Um, just a question about yeah. these monies to Indian agents for distribution. Do you mean the annuity payments? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the annuities, well, actually, though, they, they don't go to Indian agents initially. They go to the Hudson's Bay Company uh, until 1859. The, the HBC did the distributions up until 59, I believe. And then the outflows, uh, the reference to outflows to cover expenditures related to distribution, that's incorrect as well, because again, I was thinking about Huron where there's a lot of expenses uh, for distribution, but for whatever, well, it's not a mystery. It's because the HBC handled the, handled the annuity payments. There's no expenditures related to distribution. There's just two or three very small expenses that are recorded in the account. And, Two of them are reversed later, so there's no net loss. And then there's one that's unexplained. There's $10 for a sane net. I have no idea why they spent $10 on a sane net at some point in the 1850s. It's quite unusual. Um, within this account, it's unusual. What's the word? A sane net, uh, S-E-I-N-E. -E. It's a fishing net. It's a big oh. fishing net, like a, um, you use it with a school of fish to catch a lot of them. And so, Bullet point four, or sorry, bullet point three. That's um, that would be a, a Huron territory issue. Uh, is no, right? both, no, th yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, because it goes to the HPC until fifty nine in so, the Superior Territory. In the Superior Territory until eighteen fifty nine, at least as best I can judge from the from the trust accounts. Uh, that's how it looks to me. Right. And then what happens after 1859 in it, the Robinson Superior Treaty? It goes to Indian agents for, for payment and distribution. And that's when there are expenses related to it. No, actually the expenses, I, I honestly don't know why. It's not until the 1870s and 80s they start charging expenses, but they don't come out of the, I'll get to that, but they don't, they don't come out of the amount that gets okay. distributed. Thank you. And then there's some expenditure for a fishing net. Yeah. yeah. 
a one time. Thank you. And then, yeah, then small amounts of money might be retained from one year to the next, um, reflecting annuities. But I, that rarely happened in this time period. Yeah, no, there, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud here to make sure I'm accurate on this because the Hudson Space distributing it, you don't see any amounts that are withheld up to 59. And then I would have to look at the original account again to see if there's any amounts that aren't distributed between 60 and 62. But prior to that, so there's nothing sitting in the account from one year to the next, everything is flows out in it. That changes later. In circumstances where um, annuities might not be fully distributed in a year, why why would that be? Because someone didn't show up to collect their annuity. And so those would be considered arrears from a annuity pay list record keeping point of view. Um, and just so the court understands the mechanics of the flow of money, could you please explain sort of step-by-step step in this time period, how the money flowed in the Robinson Superior Treaty-wide accounts from the legislature all the way into the hands of the individual treaty beneficiaries, just so we have a, a visual picture, mm. a picture of that money flow. Okay, well, um, it starts with uh, the legislature approving um, through an appropriation, uh, the funds necessary to pay these annuities, and you find those in the in this le legislative papers. Um, then there's a, a transfer uh, from the receiver general through to the Robinson Superior Trust Annuity Fund account. Usually, the entry in the in the um, ledger refers to the a letter from the uh, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs. It's cryptic, these, these notations are very brief. So uh, really it's just saying that by authority of the Superintendent General, this amount is credited to the account, $500 or whatever, whatever the case might be. From there, uh, up until 59, uh, a payment has go goes to the HBC to reimburse the Hudson's Bay Company for their payment of the annuities and distribution. So they would have paid out of their own funds before, right. they, before they got the, that's, the legislative amount? Yeah, that's what it looks like. I, I, if we go to the next page, I'll see if we can read it. Uh, if you could go to slide 21, please. Yeah, now go ahead one more time. Oh, slide 22, please. And one more time. Slide 23, please. Okay, all right, so here, uh, we're not going to be able to read it very well, but um, let me look in the, uh, it's low. I'll just look in here. So this is just zooming in on the, on the, um, on the annuity account from the ledger book. This is the very first uh, ledger book for the Robinson Superior Treaty. So it says up there, two paid Sir George Simpson advanced by him. So. I, read, I take from that that the Hudson's Bay Company advanced the funds necessary to pay the treaty annuities and was reimbursed. Uh, next entry in, 50, in 1853, January 12th, two paid Sir George Simpson advanced by him. Uh, same thing in 1854. Well, actually there's two entries in 1853, but one's for the following year. 54 again. Is Sir George Simpson, go down to 56. Yeah, that's a transaction. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's to Chief Totomeni, and I, I don't know why that happened. But so just returning to the description of the flow mm -hmm. of money, could you sort of- Yeah, sorry, the sorry. Steps, please? I got sidetracked. It's, yeah, I spent too much time with this document. Um, so the, um, so I, I don't, I'm not going to describe what happens with the HPC when they pay the annuities because I didn't look at that. I've read it before, but it's not part of the work I did for this. Um, after the 
agents received the uh, after the agents started receiving the amounts to pay the annuities, they would have paid them and kept a pay list in duplicate or triplicate. Most likely, they would have kept a copy of the pay list themselves, and then they would have sent a copy into the district office or the you know the regional, the area, the superintendency, and then a third copy would have gone to uh, to headquarters to the clerks there. So that's basically the process. Okay. Um, I've been informed it's a little after 3.30, which is often when we break uh, in the afternoon. Yep. Take that break. 15. Thank you. All right. Um, your honor so I spoke to my friends earlier about timing yes um so I anticipate from here on uh Mr. Angel's direct should be a little bit less than half a day. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Schachter said that his cross he thought would be somewhere between half a day and three quarters of a day. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Gover, although I hope he doesn't mind that I say it, he has been wrong before, suggested that he might be 35 minutes. Um, so I feel like it's going to be a very full day on Thursday. Um, my suggestion uh, is, is twofold. First, if we could go to 4.45 today, and then well, we, we didn't start early. I'm going to check with reporter and staff. Maybe we can go all the way till five today so that if that works for people, I don't want to press. I don't want to be, um, well, I'd like to avoid being too pressed uh, tomorrow. So let's try that. And then uh, if we could start maybe tomorrow at nine, because if, uh, if Mr. Shacker takes mm -hmm. three quarters of a day. Um, okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so back on slide 20, um, or could you go to slide 20, please? It's slide 27 right now. Um, was there any, I think, uh, Mr. Angel, you've already spoken to this. Was there anything else you wanted to say about slide 20? I think you covered all the points, but I just wanted to check. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, let's go to slide 21. Uh, what would you like to tell us about slide 21? So this is the first page of the account for the um, Robinson Superior Annuity Trust Fund account. So this is what I call the treaty-wide account, and this is starting in 1851 and going to uh, 1860, I believe. It's both sides of the account. So on the right-hand side, it shows the revenues or incoming monies. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, the debit side of the ledger, it shows all the outgoing monies, outflows. So it's a very simple account, this one. Uh, not a lot of activity in it. Okay, uh, slide 22, what would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, all I wanted to point out with uh, slide 22 is um, you can see uh, notations here, they're very uh, minimalistic. Um, the very first entry by annuity under treaty of last year, in 1852, it says, by annuity, Treaty of 1850, W.B. Robinson. Uh, and then there's that reference to a piece of correspondence from a gov senior government official. In this case, it's the provincial secretary. So if one wanted to go back into the correspondence records of the provincial secretary's office, you could presumably find a letter. The date's hard to read on this copy, but looks like something in July of 1852. You'd presumably find the authority saying, based on this parliamentary or legislative appropriation, transfer these funds over to the annuity fund account. And um, 
the following year, you've got another reference to the provincial secretary. I think in 1856, you see Pennyfather, who's the civil secretary or the SGI, sorry, superintendent general of Indian affairs start showing up there. So no, nothing dramatic, just kind of the mechanics of how this account operated. And I'll point out too that the sums are in pounds at this point. In 1858, they switch over to dollars at a rate of four dollars to one pound. Uh, could you tell us about slide 23? Uh, we've already spoken about this slide. It's the debit side of the ledger, just the uh, transfers or advances. Sorry, the payments to reimburse the Hudson's Bay Company for the advances that they made on annuities. Okay. Could you please tell us about slide 24? So now we'll move to the band specific accounts and just say again that those are my terms. Uh, band specific. So there's only one Robinson Superior Treaty First Nation that had a band specific trust fund account in this period. It's Mishpakoten. Uh, they had two accounts. They had a land fund account uh, that recorded the proceeds of a land sale and then the investment of those proceeds in debentures and the interest that was received on those debentures. And then there's also the debenture account that recorded the particulars of the investment. And just in the last couple of days, thinking about those debenture accounts more further, I, and I think I may have said this already, I think it's better to think of those debenture accounts as registers. They, they, they are a record of all of the different investments that were made uh, rather than a, an account that tracks transactions. So the land fund captures transactions, whereas the debenture account is really just capturing the initial purchase of a security and these um debentures that were that were purchased um were they purchased by crown officials on behalf of mitch bakot and first nation yes that's true go ahead uh, could you please tell us uh about slide 25 Slide 25 is from the same ledger book as we've been looking at. It just shows the folios that have the entries for the land fund of the Mishpakotan First Nation. Same organization, so receipts on the right-hand side, expenses on the left-hand side. Uh, I think if we go to the next slide, it should be zoomed in on the okay, let's debit go to slide side 26, of the ledger. Please. So there we can see an entry under date June 20th, 1856, two paid TG readout for consolidated. I'm spelling this out in full. It says Con Mon Loan Fund, MUN. So that stands for Consolidated Municipal Loan Fund. Debenture number 1614 with interest from same date, 6% per Superintendent General's letter, 11 June 56. So from that, we can see that the superintendent, superintendent general gave the authority for the purchase of the debenture. If we look in the debenture account, we'll see an entry with that number, the name of it, and the, um, the amount of interest and so on. Uh, and then from here, we're just on the debit side. So it's not showing the interest that's received. If we looked on the other side of the ledger, we'd see the interest that that comes in. So if we move to slide 27, you're now into part D of your slides. And could you please tell us about slide 27? Okay. So in the late 1850s, as um, the government was preparing to take over responsibility for the Indian department from colonial officials, which included financial responsibility. Um, there were concerns raised within the legislature and then within the senior government officials about the risks that uh, existed with respect to investments. Uh, 
Can I just get you to help me here? Sure. In the late 1850s, which government was preparing to take over? Province of Canada. From? Imperial. From Imperial. So you have, are you said taking over responsibility from colonial officials? Oh, I, I misspoke then. <laughs> okay. Thank Thanks. you for catching that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, take it. That's, uh, so UPC is taking over from the Imperial. That's correct. Thank you. So they're, they're concerned about, there's a lengthy memo from the Minister of Finance, Galt, uh, to the uh, Executive Council. Uh, goes on quite, goes on for a ways, but the, they're concerned about the risk of loss on investments that had been made. Not the debentures, but in particular, they, he raises the um, case of the Grand River Navigation Company, which declared bankruptcy, entered bankruptcy proceedings right around this time. So in his report, the minister explains why he thinks that the government might want to secure the Indian trust fund. I'll explain what that means in a moment and even make good on losses. So I've got a lengthy quote on the next slide. Sure, let's go to slide uh, 28. Uh, I'll read it, but I'll break it up as I read it and comment on, on certain details. So this is from the Minister of Finance, a report the executive council. In dealing with the Indians of whom the government has constituted itself the guardian, it would appear desirable so to secure the fund. So when he says fund there, he means the Indian trust fund in its entirety there, as to prevent the possibility of any failure in the payment of the annual sums required for the Indians. So those annual sums required, so that's a combination of two things. That's the annuity payments, but it's also the interest payments on investments because the investments are a very important way to generate interest that then goes to the nations, which pays for a lot of community expenses. So there's two flows of money there that they're concerned about. As such failure uh, would certainly- Sorry, Mr. Angel, could you yeah. just give uh, her honor some time to catch Oh, her? certainly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, as such failure would certainly be attributed to a breach of faith on the part of the government, and could never be explained to the satisfaction of the tribes. By maintaining the present system of investment, so that's the system we've talked about where the government official, there's funds available with, that are pertain to a particular First Nation, they invest them in debentures. That's the system he's talking about. Um, by maintaining that system, it might also result that one tribe would find its annual interest regularly paid, while others would meet with disappointment. So he's not explaining in detail what the circumstances are, but what he's suggesting is that what if one of these investments didn't return the, the interest? So you have one nation that's receiving its annuities or its interest payments and another that's not. And they want to avoid that circumstance. Should such an event arise, Parliament would probably find it necessary to make good the losses of the trust. When he uses the word trust there, I take it to be the same thing as the fund that's mentioned in the third line. I, I think they're the, it's fair to say they're the same thing. And it would therefore be, and I looked this up later, the word that's missing there is more, where it says one word. So it would therefore be more advisable to carry the funds at the credit of the trust to the consolidated fund and to charge the annual interest upon that fund at such scale as might appear equitable to the legislature. So that sentence there about, or that phrase to carry the funds at the credit of the trust to the consolidated fund. So what he means then is there's investments uh, held on behalf of First Nations that form part of the Indian Trust Fund. And he's saying those, those securities should be um, made part of the consolidated fund. So they're held now by the province of Canada and the amount that they're worth is placed on the books for those First Nations so that they no longer have any risk there. <clears throat> and then finally, the interest rate he's saying is, is um, up to the legislature to, to recommend, although as it turns out, it's the executive council that makes the decision on the rate of interest. Uh, let's go to slide 29. 
please tell us about slide 29. So there's a wider discussion happening right now. It's not just about the Indian Trust Fund, it's about other trust fund investments that the province is liable for, or uh, I'm not trying to use legal terms here, but they, they're responsible for in some capacity. Um, and so by order in council, November 23rd, 1859, the province of Canada assumes all of the trust fund investments for which the province was liable, except for the Indian Trust Fund. They hold off on doing that for the Indian Trust Fund. Then on January 16th of 1861, the province of Canada takes on or assumes responsibility for all of the Indian Trust Fund investments, places these on the books in the same manner as had been done with the other trust fund investments in 1859. So at this point, the province of Canada is basically guaranteeing uh, they've they, they're guaranteeing that the that all of those investments, the value that they held, uh, is is now credited to the to the nations and who, who own those who have those securities, and the government will uh, pay interest on it thereafter. So they're interposing themselves between the original bond issuer and the First Nation. So, using as an example, perhaps the Mitch Bakoden First Nation, can you tell us what? happened to Mitch Bakoden, the investments that the Crown held on behalf of Mitch Bakoden as a result of this policy? It would be easier if I explain that when we get to the... Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll I, get, I will. Sure. Okay. So let's get to slide 30 then. Please tell us about slide 30. Okay. So uh, that last order in council I mentioned it's January 16th, 1861. It's effective January 1st. My understanding, clear understanding is the government ceased to invest trust fund monies in securities. So from there on in, they're not investing any trust fund monies in securities. Now, they're still holding some that predated this. Um, I think there's some, oh no, let me make sure I'm not misspeaking here. <laughs> I'm just thinking about There's a category of worthless investments that they don't assume because they have no value. So they can't be said to be still holding on to investments because they're, they've declared them, they've written them off. Okay, sorry for that um, sidebar there. <laughs> uh, these these so-called worthless investments, do you recall what they were, or what some of them were? Uh, there's a long, there's a list of them. The only two I remember by name because they are written in the account is the Grand River Navigation Company stock and the Cayuga Bridge stock, both held by Six Nations. So in the first instance, they interpose, that's your word, they interpose themselves between the initial bond holder and the First Nation, but shortly after they cease investing. Correct. And so, where they are interposed, it's only on prior purchased investments. That's right. Yeah. And sorry, Mr. Angel, before you go on, you say as of January 1st, 1861, the government ceased to invest Indian trust fund monies and securities. Do you mean from, eight, from that date until the end of the time period that you covered in your report? Correct. Okay. So, and that's till? 1909? March, yeah, March 31, 19. Can I just say as well that you, you said um, interposed between them and the bond holders, but yes. it would be between them and the bond issuers. Bond issuers, right, thank you. Yeah. And you did get it right, yeah. or that was me. And the, so they don't invest, what do they do with the money? They pay interest on it. They simply pay interest. Thank you. So can you just describe a little more what you mean by that? Sure. So there's a little bit of uncertainty here. Uh, there's an order in council in September of 1861, I believe, that sets the rate of interest at 6% on previous investments that were assumed. Remember that some of those investments, about 10% of them were at 5%. So I tried to find out if any investments after this um, after this 
act of the government. If any of those 5% investments continued, to, but we're only paying 5%, I couldn't figure it out. So it's possible that there were 5% investments that continued, but the language of the order in council makes it sound like they applied that 6% rate to everything. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just not, it doesn't have any relevance to, no, well, I won't speak to its relevance. That's not for me to, okay. <laughs> And so what, maybe taking Mitch Bakoda and First Nation as an example, what, what happened? Can you tell us <coughs> right. like, you know, you have already testified that Mitch Bakoda had certain investments. What, what happened to those investments? Mm -hmm. What did they get in return and all that? So the value of that investment gets credited to their account. It's a new account because there's a new account structure, which we'll get into in a moment. But the value of their investment, which is $900, I think, um, gets credited to their account and then interest of 6% is paid on that. And it could be still getting paid to this day. I have no idea, but yeah. it's, um, it's on their books. They've got credit of that amount on the books and then the interest that gets paid on it. And who pays the interest? Government of the province of Canada up till 1867, then government of Canada. And is the, is the, um... First Nation at any risk of not receiving the interest? I can't speak to the risk of government defaulting. I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, so let's go to slide 31, please. So this is the new account structure that I referred to. So as of January 1, 1861, the old structure, land fund, annuity fund, debenture fund, that's replaced. And there's a transitional period of about a year and a half. And remember that these, the, the structure of these three types of funds, this applies to individual First Nations. Um, so it doesn't apply to the other funds in the, in the Indian trust fund system. Um, so individual First Nations, they get a new general account. Oh, Just, sorry, yeah. before, before you get into that, when you say individual First Nations, nations is this a reference to what you have elsewhere called the band specific trust accounts well they're not exactly the same thing i mean individual first nations are individual first nations band specific accounts just means accounts that are for one sp for specifically for a band okay yeah and this change that you're describing does it apply to the robinson superior treaty wide accounts you'll get to that Yes, I'll get to that. Okay, sorry. Yeah. sorry no, no, I, I wasn't. Um, Usually they say it to me. I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this, let me, on, on this point. So for beginning in 1861, but for a transitional period, that's about a year and a half. The three funds that were on the books for each First Nation are replaced by a new single fund. Yes, there's a general fund or a general account, I mean. So the debenture fund doesn't need to be there anymore because they've taken over those. So they've- Unless there's pre-existing ones. Oh, but it's only Mitch Picotin that might have them. Uh, no, Mitch Picotin, um, their, their debenture is now just credited to their account. Okay. The, the value of it goes into their account. So, so for each individual First Nation, what happens to these three accounts? Yeah, uh, they get replaced by this gen single general account, um, which is there until July 1st, 1862, when they divide it into two accounts, principal and then interest and annuity. And this is when you see finally the organization of the trust fund accounts that still exist today. So today you have something called a capital account and a revenue account. That's the same structure here. So the principal account is the place where the department puts the money that's supposed to sit for long periods of time and accumulate interest and build up, build up, or sorry, not build up, but um, produce a flow of income into the interest account. And initially that interest account is called the interest and annuity account, but then it just gets renamed as the interest. I've called these sub accounts because when you look in the ledger book, the account technically is, 
is the name of the First Nation. So it's a Mitch Bacodin account, well, that's, or uh, Fort William account or whatever it might be. And then between that, you've got two columns, one for principal and one for interest and annuity. And interest and annuity, but the interest, the interest flows from the principal, mm -hmm. but the annuity is an annual amount that is paid in. It is, and this is where it's confusing because this has no, no relevance to the Robinson Treaty nations because their annuities go through that treaty-wide annuity fund account. Mm -hmm. So this annuity, the fact that they call this an uh, interest in annuity, they're talking about the annuities for the uh, other upper Canada nations that had annuity payments. So there's these two flows of money that nations have. One is interest on investments and the other is the annuities. Those are the two big sources of income that communities have to work with. The difference between Robinson and the other nations is that with Robinson, the annuities flow through this one big they account. They flow through, but when they get to their individual first nation, where do they go? Into people's pockets. Oh. They don't go into one of these accounts. No. no. Except. There so is at the treaty wide basis, yeah. there's a distribution to individuals? Yes. And there's one exception that you're going to test. We'll, we'll talk to a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. There is one one nation where, for a period of time, the annuities do do flow through the nation's annuity account, mm -hmm. and that's Batchewana. And I'll explain uh, when that took place. Okay, so let's go into slide 32, which is the beginning of your part E of your slides. Can you please tell us about slide 32? Yeah. So I think you asked, Your Honor, the, um, what happened to the treaty wide annuity account? And it essentially remained unchanged because it's, it's this strange account where it's not associated with a particular First Nation. So they call it an annuity account, but it wasn't, there isn't a corresponding land account or a corresponding debenture account or something like that. So it, it just remains as it is. It's a single account. There's no sub accounts in it. And oh, the, sorry, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Mr. No, Rachel. of course. You say it remains as it is in, in what time period? Yeah, of course. From 1862 to 1870. The treaty wide superior account looks the same. It's a single column of information on the debit side, a single column on the credit side. So you don't have this division between principal and interest in annuity. You just have that single column there. This is different from the Robinson Huron annuity account. It does have that division into principal sub account and interest, but the principal sub account is empty. So it's just a, okay. But I, I, yeah. I, I thought you started this section by saying at the, uh, on a treaty wide basis mm -hmm. from 1862 to 1870, the account looks the same. It does. Okay, and those characteristics are? You just have a credit side of the ledger and you have a single column of information on the credit side of the ledger, just like you did before from 1850 to mm -hmm. 62. And on the left hand side, you've got the debit side. And, you... and the credit side is the annuity? The receipt of the annuities, yeah. Credit side just means that's the money coming in. So coming in. Annuities coming in. Debit side means those are the monies flowing out. And those flowing out were distributions to individuals. Right, although the these accounts don't capture that distribution to the individuals, they just capture it at the level of it going to an agent. Oh. So the pay lists are where you get the individual level record keeping. Thank you. And the comparison with Robinson-Huron Treaty is simply that the account for Robinson-Huron for whatever reason, the bookkeepers drew a line and headed one of them principal and headed the other one interest, but then they didn't fill anything in because there is conceptually, there's no principal associated with the annuity account. At this, at this time. There's, <laughs> there, there's just a flow of money in and out, right? So, so this is, this is like the, this would be core, the... Uh, could I say, because you said it, con it looks the same, could I say it continues to be a flow through account? Yes. 
and and that doesn't hold true for the entire time period. So it's just in this time period that it's 1862 to 1870. It's operating on that basis. Yeah. Okay. Would it be possible to go to? Oh, so sorry. Before oh, I'm we, sorry. we go anywhere, was there? Um, there's a question I wanted to ask, but I wanted to give oh, you an opportunity of course, to finish yes. the slide first. Are you done with slide 32? Well, I, for the next few slides, I I wanted to be able to go back and forth between the slides and table D2 in the report. This is the detailed table um, because I I want to show how this table captures the information that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, before we do that. Just the last bullet you have on your slide, it says money flows continued as before, just so we're clear on how the money is flowing. Mm -hmm. You said before, so between 1850 and 1862, the money flowed in a certain way. And I think you're saying it continued to flow in that same way between 1862 and 1870. Can you just remind us all, just at a high level, what that money flows looks like from legislature to individual recipient, just so that we're aware of what this same money flow Mm -hmm. is in this time period. So the value of the annuity for the treaty as a whole is entered into the credit side of the account uh, under with a reference to some authority, probably the, uh, the piece of correspondence from the superintendent in general. And where, where does that money come from? Comes from, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, it comes from parliament, our legislature approved it. So it comes through the receiver general and then into the treaty-wide annuity account. And then from there, uh, it'll go to one or more agents. I can't recall with this. I think it's probably just one agent at this time, but I'd have to look at the accounts to be sure. And then it gets distributed to individuals. But you just see a single entry there. You don't see all those, the breakdown into individuals. Thank you. Um, and I think, you had said that you wanted to look at table D2, was it? At page 70 in my report. Uh, okay, so let's yeah. pull up a copy of that. And so what what is uh, table D2 telling us? So what I've done here is I've I've gone through the... And where would I find it, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. it's, so if you go to uh, Mr. Angel's final report, uh, it's page 70. Thank you. And this is also a multi-page report, multi-page chart. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so can you please tell us about table D2? Sure. So uh, I'm just gonna go through it column by column. So. The date range covered by the first entry here is from July 9th, 1851 to March 31st, 1870. So July 9th, that represents the first entry and the opening entry in the account. The account structure. So single ledger account titled North Shore Lake Superior Indians Annuity Fund. So I just give the different names that were applied to it. Single ledger account, meaning there's there aren't any sub accounts, and there's a debit and a credit side to it. Um, under revenue, so this is the money flows. So this is how we understand the flows in detail. If you if you want to see them and how they change over time, there's revenue from uh, treaty annuity amounts between 1851 and 57. There's 500 pounds coming in annually. Between 1858 and 1865, there's $2,000 coming in annually. Then from 66 to, six, sorry, 1866 to 1869, there's $1,898.50. The reason for that is because Batchewana, uh, its annuity amount goes directly to the Batchewana nation. And there's an, an account for Batchewana for that purpose. The final entry, on the revenue or credit side of the ledger dated April 1st, 1870 records $40,000. 40, $40, that's the amount in the entry. And then, it, and then it says in the notation, amount of capitalization of annuity. So I've been working 
on the basis that that capitalization took effect on April 1st, 1870. I understand that this has been uh, discussed and that another date is, is uh, July 1st, 1869. I was provided with a copy of the sessional paper where it shows that. I did some more research into what's happening with these entries here and try not to get too much into the weeds here, but there's an audit that happened with the Indian Trust Fund account sometime in and around 1869 and 70. I only know that from the accounts themselves. So they restate what the account looks like for 1870. And there's a notation next to the annuity payment for 1870. Uh, no, for 1869, sorry. So the $2,000 in 1869, when there's the regular entry for that on the credit side, it says disallowed. I don't know what that means, but what it's telling me is that the, it's part of this restatement of the accounts. And I think what happened, and again, I'm not an accountant, but I've worked lots with accounting records and, and helped prepare them and so on. The ledger book is, the, is an, an, an initial book of account. It's where the first entries are made about those accounts. Afterwards, you do a review of it. If you do an audit, you often restate the account because you discover errors or, or you know, things that need to be corrected. What we're seeing in the sessional papers, I believe is a restated version. So they've decided that for whatever reason, I have no idea why the capitalization they're dating it is July 1st, 1869. That's just speculation on my part. I think it's informed speculation, but, um, but everything in my report refers to April 1st. 1870 is the date of this capitalization. So I just wanted to clarify that. Under distributions, uh, you know, we've already- Sorry, you're not talking about date, table D2 again? Yes, we're, we're back to table D2. On the fourth column. Fourth column, thank you. Distributions. So I mentioned the, the payments that went to Sir George Simpson or in his name for the Hudson's Bay Company. They continue to 1859. The amount varies slightly from year to year. I, I don't know why, I haven't looked at those records. I presume it's because the amount that was distributed and paid out was different. But, and he, I presume the HPC provided a, a statement to the government that said, this is how much we distributed or expended, but I'm just presuming that. Um, um, Mr. Angel, I just see from this first row that the amount, the annual payment to Sir George Simpson is 485 pounds, but that's less than the 500 pound amount of the annuity. Do you know why? Mm, much what I just said. Uh, I don't know why, but I assume it's because that's how much was distributed. Okay. Um, the term for distribution in quotes is to describe a payment to Simpson is first used in 1856 for a payment of 474 pounds, 12 shillings, six pence. Separate distributions, this table or this row continues on the next page. If you can just go to the next page for a moment and then we'll back up again, just because the footnotes take up so much space. Um, so separate distributions of 1,898.50 and 101.50 begin in 1859 continued 1865. In 1866 and 67, there's a single distribution of 1,898.50. And in 1868 and 1869, there's a single distribution of 1,923.44. So the change that takes place in 59 to 65, that reflects a division. So for whatever reason, the annuities are being paid to the Robinson Superior Nations as a whole, but 10150 is being taken out of that and paid to Botswana, which is a Robinson Huron band. I don't know the story behind that. I don't know why that was the case. I haven't looked at it. Then when you see the single distribution of 1898.50 in 1866 and 1867, that's because the amount is now flowing through the Batchawana account directly. It's not going through here. And what do you say it is? It's 101.50, right? Correct. Thank you. 
And then 1868 and 69, the single distribution of 1,923.44. I don't know why it's that. I'm, I'd have to look at the, I'd have to look at the uh, originals again. I'm, I can do that and then come back with an answer, uh, but I don't. Uh, I'm not sure there was any question. No, about okay. No, right. no. Um, so I, I, I think for the, the court's purposes, um, what what can we take about this column of distributions? Like what, what at a high level, what okay. are you describing in yeah, that column? So, fair enough. So, I know I'm getting into the nitty gritty of it, but <laughs> the, the reason I'm doing this is because the, the questions that you asked repeatedly operated at this level of detail, right? Like what happened with interest payments for this precise period, et cetera. The only way to capture that is to do it in something like this, right? That's what the purpose of this table is. So if someone has a question about precisely what happened in a given year, that's where they can go to this instead of going to the, going to the original ledger book. If we could go back to the previous page, I'll just finish the other two columns. So you're saying it's my fault. <laughs> no, no, he's saying I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay um so there's a other expenses so i'm sometimes there are other expenditures out of these accounts very little in the lake superior account um there's a transfer to the ojibwe of lake huron account no reason given i don't know what it's for the transfer to chief totem Mane. Again, I don't know what it's for. And then there's that small expenditure on fishing gear. Outside of that, there's no debits in this time period. So 51 to 70. And then in terms of interest, uh, so no interest is credited to the account until the final quarter of 1866, 67. Ah, uh, there's the source of our, that's our other bit of money, 2373. So remember when I said there was a higher distribution? That's where it's from. So there is interest being paid on the balance and then that gets added to the annuity amount and then it gets distributed. See, I rediscover these things each time I look at them because <laughs> I can't remember it all. So, so the, the sum of 2373 was interest paid on the amount not distributed? Except it's not gonna be that because it's all distributed. What happens is that the money sits in the account for a reporting period and it mm -hmm. earns interest then. So, so we, that's why it's so big. Mm -hmm. can't, it, it's not just on the money not distributed. So yeah. it was on the whole exactly. amount. Okay. And the footnotes are really important here. I mean, nobody wants to go into this in detail, but if you need to, the footnotes break down all the calculations, the reasoning, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So. Just for future. If the footnotes are really important, smaller font doesn't actually make sense. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> so endless hours of fun for the careful reader. <laughs> um, so maybe let's go back to slide 33, <coughs> I think is where we would have left sure. off. And this is where we're talking about capitalizations. Please tell us about slide 33. <clears throat> okay. So I can be brief with the first capitalization because I've already explained how the records that I used showed that capitalization in 1870, but the sessional papers indicate it's from July 1st, 1869. The second capitalization occurred in- Oh, sorry, before we move on to the yep. second capitalization, what do you mean by capitalization? Ah, okay. Um, that's when a sum of money, at, you take the flow of money that the annuity represents and you say what sum of money at a given interest rate will generate that. I'm sure you've heard this many, many times. So, um, so capitalizing is simply uh, the capital sum that's necessary to generate that flow of money in future at a given rate of interest. And this first capitalization in 1869 of $40,000, do you know who paid it? It was bound up with the arbitration and the awards and so probably well, sorry don't, i don't you, know i shouldn't know. speculate I, I i actually don't know for sure who paid it i don't okay sorry so i interrupted you your second bullet yes um no third bullet so oh uh, 
I think just so that it's that's clear for the court, if the second bullet. Oh, can you yeah. just speak to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the amount of forty thousand was credited to the principal sub account of the Robinson Superior Treaty treaty wide account under date July first, eighteen sixty nine. And then there was a second capitalization that was agreed to between Quebec, uh, Ontario, and Canada in 1900. That accounted for an increase in the amount of the annuity, but for whatever reason, and I haven't explored the correspondence around this, and uh, this amount, this, uh, this capitalized amount was not added to the treaty-wide account, the Robinson Superior treaty-wide account until June 30th of 1903. So that count, uh, I'm referring here to the capital subaccount. It used to be known as the principal subaccount. It was renamed the capital subaccount in, I think, 1877, 78, 1877, 1878 fiscal year. And the amount of $93,181.82 was credited to the capital subaccount of the RST treaty wide account. Can you please tell us about slide uh, 34? So as I explained previously, there was no principal sub account within the treaty wide RST account from 1862 to 1870. There was just that single column. Between 1870 and 1909, the only monies flowing into the treaty-wide principal, later renamed capital subaccount, came from those two capitalizations in 1869 and 1903. But that's not absolutely correct because there's also the transfer back in of the Batchawana amount, which is roughly two thousand dollars. And I will explain that in more detail soon. The monies that stayed in the account consisted of these capitalized sums. When you say the account, you mean the treaty-wide principal subaccount? That's correct. And the monies that flowed out of the treaty-wide principal subaccount were limited to interest that was paid into the treaty-wide interest subaccount. So in other words, there's a flow a value of the value of the annuities flows from the capital subaccount to the interest subaccount each year. So it flows between sub accounts. Correct. Yeah, just an entry. Two thousand dollars out from the capital account. Two thousand dollars in to the interest sub account. Okay. Was any interest earned on amounts in the treaty wide principal sub account deposited back into that same sub account? Can, oh, I see the question. No, interest was never deposited back into the capital or principal sub account. It always flowed into the interest sub account. So, in other words, you didn't have compounding happening in the principal sub account. So, it wasn't an investment account in the sense of compounding. It was a, it was there to generate that flow for the annuities. Was there um, compounding that occurred in the treaty-wide interest subaccount? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's go to slide 35, where you talk about the treaty-wide interest subaccount. Please tell us about slide 35. So the time period I'm looking at here is 1862 to 1870. And one of the reasons I asked to go look at that table D2 in detail was just so that when I correct myself here, it makes a little more, more sense. So I'm saying here on the slide that the money's flowing into the RST treaty-wide interest subaccount between 1862 and 1870 consisted of interest on account balances. That's true. We saw that $23 or whatever it was. Legislative grants. Oh, sorry, interest from where? Where's this interest coming from? Ah, sorry, that's, that's interest that was paid on the balance in the uh, in the account. Is that the principal account or the interest account? Well, we don't actually have uh, that distinction between 1862 and oh, 1870. Right. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's my it's actually my fault because it's the way I, I wrote the slide. So right. 
Yeah, it's confusing. Okay. How would I fix it? Um, into the RST treaty wide treaty wide account. Just get rid of interest and sub. So it's just into that RST treaty wide account. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's interest that's earned on the balance in that account, and so that. Stay, that interest stays within the account. So potentially there is compounding actually in the account there. In, in practice, there wasn't because you, there were zero balances most years, but in principle, there could have been compounding. So I need to correct that as well. There, there could have been. Um, there was also money coming in from the legislative grants. Uh, which legislature? Yeah, that was grants? the province of Canada. Um, this is the period 1862 and, to 1870. And, and Dominion of Canada after July 1st, 1867. Refunds did not occur in this time period, so that's incorrect. Monies flowing out of the RST treaty-wide account between 1862 and 1870 included annuities uh, to individuals, and that's mis that's a bit misleading. So annuities that were eventually paid to individuals, but I think that's would have been better phrasing. Is that because the annuities flowed through a series of sort of intermediaries before they, they went? Reached? The annuities went to an. In, one or more Indian agents for distribution, correct. And then the line about the bullet point expenses related to distribution, that's incorrect. There were none in this time period for the Robertson Superior Treaty, Treaty wide account. There were for RHT, but not for RST. And there were no individual or First Nation specific monies in the account, although I'm just reading the language there. I, I don't, I'm not trying to be difficult here. I'm just thinking. Maybe I, maybe I could ask you a question. Yeah. Um, could specific First Nations deposit their money into the RH, RST treaty wide account? So what money would they be depositing? the historian i'm just wondering if they could if i they think could. it is another way of asking that question could various first nations leave their money right. in the treaty wide account does that help you mr lipton yes okay um very interesting question and if it's the other annuity accounts that nations had going back like the non-robinson treaty yeah then they could absolutely leave it in the accounts if but I, we but they didn't have treaty wide accounts. But they didn't have treaty wide accounts. But here they don't leave it in the account. No, it gets fully distributed. And is that because they don't control the account? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And a, a similar a similar question: Could individual treaty beneficiaries either deposit or leave their annuities monies in this treaty wide account? No, especially because. The distribution to individuals happens after this. Um, you know, sorry, after this. You sorry, want to clarify. Yeah, sorry, happens after what's recorded in this account. So the distribution to individuals occurs. It the distribution after the, after the money is flows out of the account. Correct. Yeah, I. If I if I understand correctly, the distribution to individuals does not happen from this account. Correct. It the distribution is to an agent. Right. So in reviewing the documents, the the uh, RST treaty wide uh, account, have you ever seen an individual's money in that account? Not in this account. And Mr. Schachter, did I ask the question uh, that you needed to have asked? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so the bottom line on these last two points was no individual or First Nation could leave in or deposit annuity money to the treaty-wide account. Can I 
just clarify that I don't want to say that they couldn't do it, right? Okay. Because of the experience of the with the other annuity accounts, it was mm. common practice for nations to make decisions around how they wanted to use their annuities. Mm -hmm. The Indian Department didn't operate on the basis at this in this time period. It didn't operate on the basis of regulations that were published in a you know the equivalent of a gazette or something like that. A lot of it was based on practice. And I don't want to preclude the possibility that if a nation said it wanted to leave it in there, okay. they could have done that, but it's not something I've ever seen any evidence of. So a better way to put it is no individual or first nation is on record right. as leaving or depositing money into the treaty wide account. I think that's a much better way of putting it. And you're satisfied with that? I am. Or an even better way is there is no record of an individual. Is that a better way to put it? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, slide 36. Could you tell us about slide 36? So this covers the period 1870 to 1909. For the Robinson for the, Superior Treaty Wide Interest Subaccount? For the Robinson Superior Treaty Wide Interest Subaccount. So looking at the monies that flow into the RST Treaty Wide Interest Subaccount. So we do have an interest subaccount as of, as of now. So one of the things that I didn't explain is that when that capitalization occurs, that's when you also see the creation of those two accounts. So you have a principal account and an interest subaccount. So the interest subaccount follows the capitalization. Correct. Thank you. And so what, what money is flowing into this RST treaty wide interest subaccount in this time period? There's interest from the RST treaty wide principal subaccount that flows into the RST treaty wide interest sub account. Did I, I, I'm losing track of what, whether I'm saying principal or interest here right now. This is the danger of late in the day. <laughs> um, I'm, gonna re, I'm gonna say that over again. I just wanna make sure that it's correct. Okay, so there's interest from the RST treaty wide principal sub account that flows into the RST treaty wide interest sub account. There's also interest that is calculated on the balances in this interest sub account and that gets credited. Uh, there are legislative grants that start showing up in 1875. This is after the annuities were augmented to $4 per person. I uh, just pausing on the legislative grants. Yeah. Uh, who made these legislative grants? Dominion of Canada. And why were the legislative grants necessary after the capitalization? Because the annuity had been augmented to $4 per person and the uh, $40,000 capitalization wasn't sufficient to meet that obligation. Why? Why would it be sufficient? Because at 5% interest, it only generated $2,000 and the annuity had been increased to $4 a head. Were the, popula was... were the populations increasing? No, the popula I have no idea what the population was doing at the time, uh, but if the 2000 was being paid out before at a lower rate, of roughly 160 a head. Um, and now you increase it to $4 a head and it's the same population. You have to increase the overall amount. The overall amount of the annuity increases. And so did Canada top, top up the interest that was coming from the capitalized amounts? That's what Canada is doing here. Yeah, those legislative grants are top ups if you want. Uh, there's also refunds start happening in this time period. So those are the four sources of monies flowing into the RST treaty wide interest sub account between 1870 and 1909. Turning now to monies flowing out of the, this same account, the RST treaty wide interest sub account between 1870 and 1909, there's annuities. Again, wording isn't the best. I say paid to individuals, it should be paid to, that eventually was 
distributed to individuals. Uh, it was paid to agents to be distributed. And then expenses related to distribution, this, that starts happening with a fair bit of regularity. I don't know why, but I looked at it again over lunch because I just wanted to be sure of this. It's not reducing the amount of the annuity. So somehow, it's, it, it surprised me actually, but somehow Canada must be paying the expenses associated with the distribution because it's, they're still paying $4 a head. So the appropriation must be sufficient to meet both the $4 a head plus these expenses. Mr. Lipton I'm, asked some questions about where did this top up come from to meet the increased annuity. Is there a reference to that on this slide? I'm at slide 36. Um, the you have the, the legislative grants. There were always legislative grants though. Now it's just a higher uh, amount, is that not see. correct? No, you're right. Yeah, no, they were always legislative grants. This okay. is, but the capitalization ended the need for the earlier legislative grant. Ah, uh, so now they're, and that's why Mr. Lipton asked the question, why do they need legislative grants again? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then the last bullet okay. point on this is a repeat of what I said about the earlier time period for this. Uh, RST treaty wide account. Uh, there were no, there's no record of individuals or First Nations depositing monies in the RST treaty wide interest sub account between 1870 and 1909. Uh, let's move on to slide 37. Could you please tell us about slide 37? So this slide just deals with the exception that I mentioned uh, with Batchwana from 1865 to 1870, the annuities flowed through Batchwana's interest sub account. So Batchwana would have had a, a principal and an interest sub account and the annuities flowed through that. And then as of December 31st, 1870, a portion of the first capitalization, so that's the 40,000 that was uh, credited to the uh, principal sub account of the RST treaty wide uh, account. So a portion of that capitalization was moved, transferred basically from, from uh, the treaty wide account to Batchawana's sub principal sub account. And then it generated interest that flowed directly into Batchawana's interest sub account. And that's what paid the annuities there for Batchawana for these years up to 1874. And then they moved it back. They moved that capitalized value back into the general, the treaty wide account in April of 1874. I don't know why this happened at all. I did, I, I did a quick search to see if I could find any red series files at the National Archives. Um, that dealt with us and I didn't see anything and I didn't want to dig deeper than that. So on the fourth bullet point, in 1874, the capitalized value was transferred. It, ha it had been in the, a separate account for Batchawana. It was transferred back into the treaty wide account. Correct. So it's just this short period of four years during which Batchawana has its own portion of the capitalized account. Correct. Okay. But before that they had, there were the annuities were flowing through there before the capitalization, there was a period of five years where they were receiving their annuities directly. Mm -hmm. Directly from? Directly, I think, I, hang on one second. Can I look yes. at my table for Please. a moment? Here? Sure, okay. yeah. Um, So the, the parliamentary grant that paid the annuities in the 1860s, the legislative grant, 
that $2,000 that was going into the treaty-wide RST account. In 1866, this is according to table D2 in my report. Mm -hmm. In 1866, it's reduced, that grant amount is reduced to 1898, $1,898.50. So the other $101.50 went directly from the receiver general then into the Batchawana account. That's how it would have looked. It skipped the treaty wide account. Correct. It did. Thank you. Is Batchawana First Nation a beneficiary of the Robinson Superior Treaty? No, I believe it's a beneficiary of the Robinson Huron Treaty. And so why did Batchawana First Nations money go from its account into the Robinson Superior Treaty treaty wide account? I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, just a point of clarification. I, I think my friend just asked the question uh, whether it was Bachawana's money that went to uh, the RST capital account, but mm -hmm. it was the capitalized portion of the government money, not Bachawana's money. I think you should clarify that. Oh, um, sh sure. Um, so the money that went from Batchawana's band specific trust account, that was money that uh, was managed for Batchawana by the crown. Is, it, is that right? I'm just trying to think through the language of this. Uh, if you can give me a moment. Um, yeah, I think this very quickly becomes a point of legal interpretation that I can't, I can't comment on. But Fair it's enough. yeah, these are these are monies that are being managed on behalf of First Nations. So whether they are the First Nations monies or Canada's monies, I have no opinion on that. Sure. Okay. So flowing from that, my own note, trying to conclude what I understood was for a four-year period, and I wrote batch one and money went directly from the receiver general to its own account, but. Is there, do I now understand it should be for a four year period, money went directly from the receiver general to Batchawana? I think that's better. I do. Yeah. yeah. Whose ever money that was, if it was. So, so if it I, was the. Because I think, I think part of what's confusing is part of this is happening before capitalization, part of it's happening after, right? So before capitalization, and if it's okay, I might leave. Yeah, here. Yeah. I might leave here. Um, don't want to. Um, so before capitalization, is it true that what's happening is money is flowing from the the province of Canada into Batchawana First Nations, what we're calling the band specific account, and then that money is flowing out of Batchawana First Nations band specific account distributed to individuals. Is that the flow before capitalization? Yes, and also from Canada too, because it, it crosses the- Oh, right. It crosses the change in jurisdiction. Yes, an, ex, an extra nuance. And then, so that's before capitalization. And then after capitalization, what happens is in 1870, there's this $40,000 payment that goes into the treaty-wide RST principal sub-account. And then a portion of that $40,000 moves from the RST treaty-wide principal sub-account to the Batchawana principal sub-account. And then a little bit complicated, that amount sits there, it generates interest. And then the interest flows from the Batchawana principal sub-account to the Batchawana interest sub-account and then that money, that interest money is distributed as annuities. Is that is that right? I think you've described the process. Yes, I I, I wouldn't use the term payment for the capitalization. Sure. Um, I don't think that's what it is. When government decides to capitalize something like that, they're not, nobody's making a payment to them. They're not making a payment to anyone. They're just saying, they're, they're essentially 
recording an obligation, a financial obligation that they have. So, and again, I'm saying that as an historian, not as a, I don't know who would comment on that, an accountant, I suppose. Okay, so okay. I think at this point, uh, I'm at a natural break, it's almost five, uh, just in terms of forecasting and timing for tomorrow. Um, I have about 10 more slides. I anticipate, my guess is it will be less than an hour. Okay. Um, if Mr. Schachter has, let's, let's be ungenerous, three quarters of a, of a day, and uh, Mr. Gover has 35 minutes, Ms. Evans has nothing, uh, my hour plus that, if we start at nine, we should make it. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> um, I'm okay. If, if I might, if we could start at 10, if we could even start at 10 and if we were prepared to go to five, if we needed it, okay. that would do it, I think. And because I, I don't want to have force people to come in and then finish at 2.30. Right. And I already made my nine o'clock appointments. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll start at 10. I think that's uh, a good idea and maybe uh, order your lunch. Okay, and there's no um, building resilience school for witnesses. So it's usually the first couple of days that are the hardest. So you don't get the benefit, Mr. Angel, of week two of your, <laughs> that you're ready for this. Okay. One, one more matter. Um, are my friends going to, uh, on, on exhibits EEFF and DD, sorry, DD, EE, and FF, um, my friends provided me with a, um, a copy of, remember, the, uh, the redact, the track changes version? And the track changes version I was provided with last night is a different version still than the one that was up on the, on the computer screen. And um, I wonder if we could sort out which version, since I've already printed these out, if we could, can we just have the PDF versions entered tomorrow that Mr. Rankin provided to me last night? Does it matter? Sure, yeah, yeah, that, that works for us. Okay. okay. Thank you. And and even for the for the court, there's no reason for me to get hard copies if we're not referring to them. Well, whatever you need, right? Straight to the court registrar. <laughs> um, okay. Yes. Now, just to say that uh, with respect to the demonstratives. I have asked the court registrar to work with you, Mr. Lipton, to remove the pages. Okay, I thought work? Mr. Schachter wanted to do the honors. He said he wanted to rip them out. <laughs> well, I'll leave. <laughs> no, I never said such a thing. <laughs> no. Not at all. <laughs> TMI. Um, you can arm wrestle for that sure. privilege. All right, so I'll leave that uh, with the court registrar. Okay. And okay, yes. Tomorrow at ten. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Just to get the discord back to this one.